<clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Kari Casey, and I'm the program manager for the Global STEM Alliance here at the New York Academy of Sciences. Today, we are excited to be hosting a special expert talk event in partnership with the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, featuring FNIH's 2018 Lurie Prize winner, Dr. James Chen. Dr. Chen is the George L. McGregor Distinguished Chair in Biomedical Science and Professor of Molecular Biology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In 2012, Dr. Chen and his team discovered the enzyme C-gas and its corresponding pathway, solving a century-old mystery about DNA. The discovery of this enzyme and its DNA sensing pathway allows us to better understand immune response as well as autoimmune diseases. For this discovery, Dr. Chen was awarded the Lurie Prize in Biomedical Sciences in 2018. This prize recognizes outstanding achievement by a promising scientist age 52 or younger and includes a $100,000 honorarium made possible by a donation to FNIH and philanthropist Ann Lurie. Stay tuned after the presentation for a Q&A with Dr. Chen, and please be sure to keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the talk. I'm now happy to present Dr. James Chen. Stop sharing my screen. All right, Dr. Chen. Okay. Hi. Right. Can you can you hear me now, Carrie? Yes, I can hear you, Doctor Chen. Okay, you can hear me now. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Good. All right. Thank you very much, Carrie. And um, I also want to thank uh, uh, the foundations uh, for the NIH and. Uh, New York Academy of Sciences for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity to uh, uh, share uh, with you um, my path to becoming a scientist. And uh, just to start, I also want to thank all of you for uh, uh, participating. Um, so uh, I am going to uh, divide my talk into three parts. And let's see if it doesn't, doesn't move. Uh, can, you, can you see my screen? Uh, Carrie. Um, yep, we got you. We can see it. Which, which one are you seeing? Because all my screen. I'm, on my screen. We can see your slides. Is that the first slide? All right. Okay. Good. All right. So I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. The first uh, part was uh, about my upbringing. Uh, that is how I came to Dallas uh, uh, from a small village in China. And then the second part, I will talk very briefly um, our discovery of a DNA sensor uh, that launches uh, the immune response. And then uh, at the end, I will uh, offer a few career advices. Um, and so each part would be about you know, 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll try to finish uh, within about 40 minutes, and, uh, and then we'll I, I would take some questions. All right, so that was me. Uh, when I was four months old, uh, it was the very first picture of my life. This was the uh, second picture of my life when I was seven years old. 
this uh, is the place I was born and grew up. Um, I lived there for about 12 years. And to just orange you, um, so I uh, grew up in a village in the southern part of China. So this is the Google map of China. Uh, this Beijing, Shanghai is here, Japan is here, Taiwan is here. And the place I grew up was quite close to Taiwan, just off the coast from Taiwan. Uh, and it's a, a small village. This uh, it actually was the street where I was born and I, I uh, lived for about 12 years. Um, and it was the main, you know, uh, the only street uh, in the whole village. Um, let me use the pen here. All right. Um, so, and that, so that was uh, the place I grew up. Uh, the, uh, my family lived on the, uh, the uh, sort of the second story uh, of this uh, small house. And, uh, you know, back then there was no running water, there was no, uh, most of the time there was no electricity. Um, so um, starting when I was seven years old, I, uh, one of my major assignments was to get uh, water from the well. Um, and I, I would get water up the stairs and um, that, that was what I was doing almost every day. And uh, because there was no electricity, it was hard to study at night. And um, so I tried to do some reading uh, during the day. Um, and back then, um, we didn't really have much appreciation for science. So, uh, you know, what I read mostly was just some novels. Uh, and when I uh, was about 12 years old, um, two things happened. Uh, one is that um, at the time, uh, China went through a, a difficult uh, period of time. Um, it was, uh, it was during the Cultural Revolution. And at the end of the Cultural Revolution, the uh, government um, was uh, encouraging uh, the students to get into science and technology. And uh, one day, uh, uh, my father uh, gave me a, a newspaper, and there's an article in the newspaper that talked about a mathematician who devoted uh, all his time uh, to study uh, mathematics, and you know he was a, a, a bit eccentric. He basically, you know, he basically would, uh, you know, study mathematics all the time when he was waiting in line, or even when he was going to uh, to the bathroom. So that was, um, you know, quite refreshing uh, uh, to me, and actually to many other kids uh, in China. Um, I was uh, really intrigued that you know someone can be uh, entirely consumed by one thing that uh, that he uh, apparently uh, wanted to do, and that was mathematics. And so that left a deep impression in me. Uh, and then the other thing that happened back then uh, was that uh, uh, the uh, government started to uh, allowed uh, students to uh, go to universities uh, based on merits. And so there was a, a national entrance examination, of which is uh, uh, equivalent to SAT in the US. And so if the kids from any part of China uh, pass this uh, uh, sort of college entrance examination, then they will be able to go to college. And, and once you go to a college, at least back then, you know, you're almost guaranteed a job. And so that, that was pretty much the only way for um, any kids in the village to, to get out and uh, to have a better life. 
and and so um, so that uh, encouraged many students to study, um, and and that included me. Uh, so I uh, graduated uh, from the high school in 1981. This was the there was uh, so there was me here. Uh, it was in 1981, uh, and and then I was uh, accepted to a university um, in the southern part of China, and uh, but uh, for the first year I was actually very uh, uh, disappointed. I was confused and uh, uh, somewhat depressed because. Uh, when I applied for a university, I wanted to go to the best university in China, but uh, I didn't do so well in the examination. So, and I was uh, uh, assigned to a university that I didn't apply to. And, and uh, furthermore, I was actually uh, sort of uh, admitted to a department a major uh, is a biology major, and I didn't apply to biology, um, and and so I was uh, I was very uh, sad to um, to to hear that I would be uh, studying uh, biology as as my major in the university. So for the for the first year, I um, really struggled. And uh, I was actually rebelling. Uh, I was about I was 15 years old when I got into college, um, and, and so that was really sort of the uh, rebellion age. Uh, so I was kind of making trouble the first year. I almost got kicked out of uh, school. Uh, one day, my father came to my dorm and you know showed me this letter. Uh, from the school, which was a warning letter, they told me that I would be kicked out of school uh, if I if if I uh, uh, continue uh, to make trouble. So, um, and then the uh, the sophomore year, the second year, then um, while I was very uh, still very confused, uh, two things happened. Uh, so by the way, there, there was me here. <laughs> and so uh, two things happened. One, uh, I started to take biochemistry class and I had a very good uh, biochemistry teacher uh, shown here. It was uh, Dr. There was a teacher Zhang uh, or Professor Zhang and he was a very good teacher. Uh, and so I became uh, really interested in, in biochemistry. And then the second thing that happened um, was that one day, totally by chance, I was chatting with a student who um, was one year above me. And he told me that it, the, the, there's this thing called uh, graduate school. And if I get into graduate school, I might be able to get a position in the university or in a research institute. And I might teach um, a little bit, but I would spend most of my time in a lab doing research. And, and I would you know, have a lot of freedom in deciding like, when I come in and when I leave. Um, and it's not like a nine to five job. And that was very uh, intriguing to me. And and so literally overnight, I changed. I totally changed. And I um, made a plan for myself. I, you know, every day I, I would get up at five o'clock in the morning. I would, I would go running in the morning and then come back uh, and study. And, and the other thing that this student told me is that to get into the and most difficult is English. So uh, back then, um, 
I knew very little about English. I was very poor in English. Uh, but but that was uh, very important to get into a graduate school. So so I would study English for two hours every morning. Uh, and then, uh, and so I started to become a, a, a very good student, at least in terms of grades. And I took part in the examination uh, for uh, enrollment into a graduate school. And I did very well. I was, I, I was in, uh, I was the first place in both English and biochemistry. And so uh, that uh, allowed me to sort of get into graduate school. And then fortunately, at the same time, uh, there was a, a scholarship program that, uh, that would uh, select, you know, the, uh, the top students to come to the United States to, uh, to uh, 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 get into the graduate school here. Uh, and, and so uh, I was selected to receive uh, this scholarship to study uh, in the United States. So I came to uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, it was in 1986. And I, I was very fortunate to select a, a, a mentor, uh, Dr. Cecil Pekka. Um, uh, and uh, so Cecil Pekka uh, uh, was a, a brilliant biochemist. Uh, and uh, she was a pioneer in a newly emerging field called the uh, ubiquitin uh, proteasome pathway, uh, which was very fascinating to me. And, and, I, and I learned biochemistry from her. Uh, so, so, uh, so that was very uh, 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 important uh, for my scientific career. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Dr. Picard passed away um, several years ago at the age of 52 uh, uh, because of uh, uh, kidney cancer. So I learned biochemistry from uh, uh, Dr. Picard. And, uh, and then at the time, uh, our lab knew very little about molecular biology you know, the DNA cloning, et cetera. So I was also very to have, to have a co-mentor, uh, Dr. Edward Niles, uh, shown here. And Dr. Niles taught me molecular biology and basically how to clone genes. And so now uh, you know, I had a, a very powerful combination. There was biochemistry and molecular biology. And that sets the foundation for um, my scientific career. Okay, so uh, after I graduated uh, from SUNY Buffalo with a PhD in biochemistry, I did a, a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral research uh, at the Salk Institute in San Diego. Um, and then uh, for uh, some reasons, we, which is some, somewhat complicated to explain, uh, and, and also because of uh, introduction by my PhD mentor, uh, Dr. Cecil Picard. I joined this uh, biotech company uh, in Boston uh, called ProScript, which was a, a really a startup company at the time. And, uh, and together with other scientists uh, uh, in the company, we developed a uh, a drug uh, uh, called Velcave, which uh, is a small molecule that inhibits uh, the proteasome, uh, which is, a, is an enzyme complex that degrades proteins in cells. And this drug um, uh, was approved later on for the treatment of uh, multiple myeloma, which is a, a blood cancer. And and, and this drug basically now is a billion dollar molecule. Uh, so in the company, I spend about half of my time um, 
helping to develop uh, uh, this drug. Uh, and then I spend the other half of my time doing uh, research uh, that is related to uh, this pathway, the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Uh, and, and because of that research, I was able to publish uh, some uh, very good papers. And that allowed me to apply for a faculty position. Uh, and, and so uh, in 1997, I uh, was recruited by Dr. Eric Olson to join the faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center uh, that is in, in Dallas. Uh, and I have stayed here uh, ever since. And, uh, and UT Southwestern is really a, a, a great biomedical research institution uh, in terms of the quality of research. Uh, you know, it, it is really second to none. So uh, I think most students have heard about MIT and Harvard. Um, some of you may not have heard about UT Southwestern, but UT Southwestern is really as good as uh, uh, the very best uh, biomedical research institutions in the world. Um, we have six Nobel laureates, uh, which are more than any other medical school in the world. So, so this is really a great place to do research. And, and this is my lab. So my lab is, uh, occupies uh, 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 the space on this, uh, here, uh, sixth floor. Uh, that's where we do research. And all right, so, uh, so that was my path from a small village in China to uh, Dallas, Texas. Now I'm gonna spend uh, a few minutes to talk about uh, uh, one of our recent discoveries, and that's the discovery of a DNA sensor that uh, activates uh, immune response. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, the, 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 the title of this talk is, is uh, Immune and Autoimmune Response to uh, Cytosolid DNA, and that is DNA in the inside as well. Uh, uh, so our interest is in immunology, in the immune system. And there are two immune systems, uh, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And innate immune system is the first line of defense against infections. So here, uh, if we get infected, by a virus, say uh, 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 influenza virus, then within the first few hours, the innate immune system is activated to, uh, to provide the uh, rapid response to infection, to provide the immediate control uh, of this uh, virus infection. And the innate immune system is also very important for activating the so-called adaptive immune system. Uh, so, so after a few days, then the adaptive immune system is activated. And so basically it's the T cells and B cells uh, that get activated and these cells then, uh, then uh, eradicate in infections. So, so, uh, so we need uh, both of these systems, the innate and adaptive immune system to fight infections by viruses, bacterial, parasites, etc. <clears throat> so now the question is, how do we know that our cells have been infected by a virus? We need a sensor. And uh, a very important sensor is a protein called TORI receptor. Uh, it's a family of proteins, uh, TORI receptors or TLRs. And the discovery of TORI receptors uh, have won the Nobel Prize uh, for Dr. Bruce Boyer and Dr. Jules Hoffman. So these TORI receptors are membrane proteins, pro uh, proteins on the, on, on, the mem on the cellular membranes, and, and they detect molecules from virus or bacteria. 
and then they will activate a so-called signal transduction cascade that lead to the activation of some uh, key uh, molecules called transcription factors. And these are really sort of the commander of the cells. They control gene expression. So for example, this protein called NFKRB is a master transcription factor that will turn on hundreds of genes that are very important in immune and inflammatory responses. Now, so this toric receptor obviously is very, very important in our immune defense against infections. But that's not the whole story. And because toric receptors are membrane proteins with a ligand binding domain facing outside the cells. So toric receptors recognize pathogens outside our cells. And they are largely blind to these bugs that have success, successfully uh, invaded our cells and in, in enter the interior of our cells. So we need another system to detect these bugs inside our cells, which are obviously very dangerous. <clears throat> and so that brings me to DNA. DNA uh, was known to stimulate immune responses more than a hundred years ago. So uh, in 1908, Dr. Um, uh, Ia uh, Magnikov received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is basically a process that immune cells, such as macrophages, will eat uh, bacteria. And, and he gave a Nobel lecture in uh, 1908. And in his lecture, he stated that there are surgeons in France and Germany who introduce into the abdominal cavity or under the skin of their patients with a warm blood serum or nitric acid, which basically was DNA, with the object of bring, bringing to the scene protective army of phagocytes to ward the microbes off, okay? So DNA was known to stimulate immune responses more than 100 years ago. And that was 40 years before DNA was known to be the genetic material that carry out genes. So of course now we know a lot about how DNA functions as the genetic material, but we still don't know, don't fully understand how DNA stimulates immune responses. So why do we want to have an immune system that detect DNA? And first of all, uh, you know, uh, this is very versatile. Uh, with the exception of RNA viruses, which is detected by a, a different pathway that we also study, all microorganisms, including DNA virus, retroviruses like HIV, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, they all have DNA and they require DNA in their life cycle. And that provides an almost universal mechanism to detect infections, okay? Because these bugs, they need DNA. So you, if you detect DNA, then you'll be able to recognize these uh, infections. And secondly, uh, detection of uh, DNA or RNA of these bugs um, provides the immune system a mechanism to detect infections inside our cells. So uh, when these bugs replicate inside our cells, they produce more DNA and RNA, and that that's the time to call in the, the immune system. But this system, the recognition of DNA, has uh, its liability because our cells have lots of DNA. And our solution to this problem is to keep our DNA out of the cytoplasm. So if we keep our DNA in the nucleus, in, in the mitochondria. But this uh, mechanism is also not perfect. And when a system fails, it can lead to autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, arthritis, a variety of inf inflammatory diseases, and, and cancer. So, so, so this is very important, uh, not only for uh, unst understanding our immune defense against infections, but also very important for uh, understanding 
a variety of uh, human diseases, including autoimmune diseases and cancer. So the key question is, what's the DNA sensor? All right, and so that's, that's where we came in. Uh, we discovered this DNA sensor. All right, so here I'm going to use this cartoon to illustrate how, uh, how this pathway works. So this is our cell, and when our cell is infected by a virus, the virus get into the cells that get into our cells, and that's a dangerous situation. The DNA, when it gets into the cytosol, is a danger signal. They can activate immune response. So how do we detect this, so in this case, foreign DNA inside our cells? And a couple of years ago, we discovered this DNA sensor, uh, which turns out to be an enzyme that we call CGAS, or cyclic GMP AMP synthase. And, and this is the structure of uh, this enzyme. So basically, this enzyme will bind to DNA, and uh, two molecules of this enzyme binds to two molecules of DNA. And uh, so the DNA will bind to this enzyme, and then it induces a the change of the shape of this enzyme or the conformation of this enzyme, such that this enzyme is now activated. And when the enzyme is activated, now it can use ATP and GTP as the substrate to make this cyclic dinucleotide or, or cyclic GMP AMP. So this is GMP, this is AMP, and has two phosphorylized bonds. And so we call this molecule CGAM of. Uh, uh, or we call it 2 pump, 3 pump CGAM, uh, cyclic GMP, AMP. And so each enzyme can make multiple molecules of CGAM. So, so you have a signal amplification even here. And then each CGAM molecule, this small molecule, will bind to a protein called STING. And STING is localized on the organelle called the uh, endoplasmic reticulum or ER. So, let me show this again. The small molecule CGAM binds to sting and that changes the conformation or the shape of this sting protein. That will then activate the transcription factors in the B that I mentioned earlier and another one for IR3. These transcription factors move into the nucleus and then they turn on hundreds of genes. They are very important in immune and inflammatory responses. So that's how we uh, uh, fight uh, infections by viruses and bacteria. Okay, so this is CGAS, it's a CGAS enzyme. It binds to DNA and it becomes activated. And work from our lab and also from other labs throughout the world uh, has shown that this CGAS DNA sensing enzyme is not only important for our immune defense against uh, infections by microbial pathogens, but it's also very important in anti-tumor immunity, immunity in a process called cellular senescence, and that is when cells permanently stop uh, dividing, or in a variety of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. And that is because this stigas enzyme it's activated by any double-stranded DNA independent of its DNA sequence. So any double-stranded DNA can activate CGAS. So CGAS, in essence, does not really distinguish our own uh, DNA from the microbial DNA, okay? So, so this enzyme, it basically it has to be tightly regulated. And one way to regulate this enzyme activity is to, uh, in our, uh, cells, we keep our DNA in the nucleus in mitochondria. Uh, and, and if our, our own DNA gets into the cytosol, then it will trigger autoimmune responses. I, or when tumor DNA gets into the cytosol, this is our mechanism to detect uh, cancer. So, so here I want to uh, show you one example of autoimmune disease. It's a disease called Akaiti Kutia syndrome, uh, or AGS. And these are the children with the disease. Uh, they have very severe calcification in the brain. This is a 
a green uh, uh, image. And these kids produce a, a, a lot of uh, uh, inflammatory molecules. And one molecule is called uh, interferon or type 1 interferon. And so although these kids, they didn't have any evidence of infections, when they were born, they produced a lot of type 1 interferons that damage their brain. And, and so that's a very uh, uh, bad disease. You know, many of the, these kids are like mentally retarded. It's a very painful disease. These kids, they can cry for days, um, and they usually die before the age of 20. And, and these kids have the disease because they have mutations in a gene, or, or many of these kids have mutations in, in a gene called TRAX1. And TRAX1 encodes an enzyme or, uh, called DNAs. And so DNAs basically is an enzyme that digests DNA. So the normal function of this enzyme is to clean up DNA in the cytoplasm. If there's any DNA that somehow gets in, into the cytoplasm from our nucleus or mitochondria. This, this enzyme, TRAX1, can clean up the DNA. But when these kids have mutations in the enzyme, they cripple its, its activity. So this enzyme doesn't work anymore. They can, cannot clean up the DNA. So the cytoplasmic DNA accumulates, and it, that triggers the production of type 1 interferons that damage the brain and other tissues. So, then we ask the question, um, do these kids have the disease because they have hyperactivation of CGAS, or this DNA sensor? So here we use a mouse model. Um, and basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a mouse that does not have uh, this gene called TRAX1. And, and these, these mice, they, they didn't have TRAX1 gene or the enzyme to digest DNA, and therefore they have very severe inflammatory diseases. They die within a few months after birth. So we asked if we take away CGAS in the trash one alcohol mice uh, genetically, then can we cure these mice? And the answer is very clear. So, uh, so here we take away CGAS gene in the trash one alcohol mice. So this is a double alcohol mice. And now 100% of the mice survive, and they, they didn't have any evidence of disease. And interestingly, even if we just remove one copy of the gene, one allele of CGAS gene, so, so now these animals have like 50% of the CGAS enzyme, then the, most of the mice, they survive, and they also did not have evidence of disease. So this suggests that if we inhibit this enzyme, if we can develop an inhibitor of this enzyme, even if we just inhibit this enzyme partially, then we will be able to provide benefits. We will be able to cure these mice. And hopefully, uh, this, this uh, inhibitor of CGAS may be used to treat, uh, maybe used to treat human diseases like AGS and possibly lupus and, uh, and other uh, uh, diseases. And indeed, um, recent work from our lab uh, and other, other labs have shown that uh, the CGAS pathway is also very important for other diseases such as senescence or age uh, associated diseases. And these include uh, macular degeneration, which is eye disease, myocardial infarction, which is a heart disease, a liver fibrosis, uh, or uh, Parkinson's disease. So, um, so the hope is that if one day uh, we can develop a, uh, a specific and potent inhibitor of this CGAS enzyme, we'll be able to use this enzyme to treat a variety of human diseases. And also, this small molecule that I told you earlier, the uh, uh, CGAM, it, it's a very potent uh, activator of the immune system. And so now we have evidence to suggest that this small molecule can be used as an adjuvant for vaccine development. And we can also use, use um, this small molecule or uh, 
analogs of the small molecule for cancer immunotherapy. And in fact, now uh, 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 some analogs of this CGAM molecule are now in uh, uh, clinical trials in human cancer patients. Okay, so, so this is the discovery. Okay, it's actually very simple. Uh, so CGAS is the DNA sensor, and it's actually an enzyme that is activated through a very simple mechanism. It binds to DNA, and that binding causes a conformational change of this enzyme. And this enzyme is now activated to produce a small molecule, which then activate immune response. And so uh, that provides one explanation for this long-standing um, mystery of, uh, of how DNA stimulates uh, immune responses. And we think that this pathway can be targeted for treating human diseases, including like, autoimmune diseases and a variety of age-related diseases. The small molecule CGAM can be used for cancer immunotherapy or vaccine development. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to share with you why I think you know, a discovery like this is exciting. Uh, so when we make this discovery, we feel that this was very exciting um, because, um, because I think it's, it's just very elegant. You know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful molecules. And it's a very sort of simple and elegant mechanism of uh, how it gets activated and, and how this can solve a long-standing mystery of how DNA stimulates immune responses. And it's also exciting that, that um, companies and laboratories throughout the world uh, are now targeting this pathway for, uh, to try to develop therapies uh, for the treatment of human diseases. But I think it, there's another reason um, that this is exciting. And, and that reason is, is less obvious and, and, and perhaps more philosophical. And so, 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 so here is a paper published by um, the laboratory of Dr. Jennifer Downer, Russell Benz, and it was done by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Philip uh, uh, Kranzos. And, um, and so in this paper, they show that the, this C anemone, anemone, so these are beautiful C sponges. They also have a functional C gas pathway, uh, which can make the CGAM molecule, and they also have a functional stem. So the, the CGAS pathway is conserved for more than 500 million years, okay? And, and so, so, so this beautiful molecule, or very powerful immune molecules, they have been in existence for you know, more than 500 million years. And, but nobody knew about this. Um, and so it's really exciting that, you know, that we were able to discover uh, these, these molecules uh, for the first time. And it is also exciting to think that, say, you know, in a thousand years, um, that these molecules are still going to be there. If we believe that the Earth is still going to be there, there's going to be uh, humans in a thousand years, uh, that, you know, when, uh, that, that these molecules, the CGAS and CGAM and STEAM, and these molecules, they are still present in every cell and every uh, person and, and, and provide this very important immune function. So in other words, I think that a discovery like this uh, had, uh, has a very, uh, uh, what basically is, is it ha ha has a long lasting impact. Um, and, and so I think it's really exciting um, to think this way that you will be able to make a, uh, a, a discovery 
that nobody has seen before and that uh, is going to last for a long time. And I think that is an uh, original discovery. And then uh, finally, I'm just going to, uh, to, to say a few words about, uh, about uh, what it takes to succeed. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what is success towards the end. Uh, but here, uh, here, I'm just going to uh, talk about uh, you know, four points. The, the goal, you need to have a goal, the will, the route, and the means. First, about the goal. And I think that uh, at this in research, in scientific research, you want to aim high. This is a quote from Dr. Marshall Nirenberg, who, uh, who saw the genetic code. Okay. Um, and he said that I thought if I am going to work this hard, I might just as well have fun, and by fun, I mean I wanted to explore an important problem, and I wanted to discover things, okay? So, you know, scientific research can be hard, and you want to enjoy the process, you want to have fun, and you also want to solve an important problem that, uh, that will have a lasting impact. So, First, you want to aim high. And then uh, you want to ask an important question. You want, you know, want to solve an important problem. Now, and, and I think this is, this is most important you know, in, in, in doing uh, research. Uh, now, if, if a problem to solve it, now, Sometimes, you know, an important question can be very difficult to answer, but sometimes the important question may not be so difficult to answer. Uh, and James, James Watson, who, um, uh, who, who discovered a sort of double helix of the DNA structure, uh, once said an uh, important problem is not necessarily a difficult one. But whether it's difficult or not, the most important thing is that that the question uh, or the problem that you have to try to solve should be a very important one. <clears throat> and also to be realistic, reward yourself by meeting or exceeding your, your target. I think if you, you know, just you're a high school student and you, you want to get into research and you're a Nobel Prize, I think you are going to have a very miserable life, you know, um, because, you know, I think that it, it's, it's going to take a long time for you to get there. And, um, and uh, you know, it, you, you, I think you, you want to enjoy the process. You want to have a realistic uh, target. Now, in my case, I think that if I look back at the, each step of my career, I, I feel that I had, but, uh, but they, were, they were not like sky high. Uh, so when I was in, the, in this uh, village in China, my highest ambition was to get into a college, any college, you know. And then when I was in college, after I learned about the graduate school, my highest ambition was to get into a graduate school, just any graduate school. And I, at the time, I, I didn't know that there was a possibility to study abroad. And then I was very fortunate to be able to, uh, to study abroad and I came to the United States, um, I got into the uh, PhD program at SUNY Buffalo. And then when I was a graduate student, my highest ambition was to become a professor, an assistant professor in, 
in, in the third year university. You know. um, and I never expected that I would uh, one day become a faculty member at a top university like UT Southwestern. Then I got into UT Southwestern and as an assistant, assistant professor. And when I, when I came to Dallas, my highest ambition was to get a tenure. You know, tenure is basically it's like a permanent um, uh, professor position. That was my highest ambition. I never, I never dreamed about getting into Howard Hughes Medical Institute or becoming a member of the National Academy. I never dream about getting a prestigious prize like, like the uh, Lurie Prize or, or the Breakthrough Prize. That was never my goal. And so I think that each step I go, which I, I was excited about, and I was able to, to meet and, and, and exceed the target. So kind of you know, rewarded myself at, at each step. And, and now, you know, frankly, my high school was not to, you know, get a, another prize or, um, or award. My high school is to make the next, next discovery. You know, hopefully we can uh, discover the next CGAS. And, and so the will, you want to have a strong will. Uh, you need to have the determination to succeed because if the stake is high, don't give up easily. If the problem that you are trying to solve uh, is very important, then you, you, you want uh, to have the will to succeed. So if your goal is to say, cure a type of cancer, uh, you know, is, if it's important, then, then you want to do whatever it takes to succeed. <clears throat> And so that uh, you need to be able to uh, persevere. And, and by uh, persevere, I mean that you want to, to be determined to, uh, to achieve the ultimate goal, but you also want to be flexible and creative in, the, uh, in the, these uh, approaches. So for example, when we set out to discover this DNA sensor, we knew it was very competitive, can be very difficult and you know we had a lot of failures but but we knew that this was a very important problem and so so we were very determined in the ultimate goal of finding this DNA sensor but we tried different approaches uh, until uh, we succeeded and you want to be focused and 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 here, I just want to mention that we want to kill that internet uh, addiction. You know, now social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, they, they, are, they, are, they are fun, they can be very useful, but uh, they are very addictive. And, um, and, and, and that, uh, it, it's becoming more difficult to, uh, to focus on a particular problem. Uh, so it is very important to kill the internet addiction. It's not easy, but it's important. And you, of course, you want to work hard, but you don't want to burn out too early. Research is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Uh, it can be a long process, and, and, and so you want to enjoy the process. Uh, and, and it's very important that you don't burn out too, too early. <clears throat> now, the route, you want to take the most direct route uh, because time is very precious. Um, of course, you want to learn as much as you can in school, that is like in high school, in, in college. In college. And, but you, you know, it's also not possible to learn everything in school. And, and so, uh, if you want to, to be a scientist, I, you know, it's important to get a PhD, but you don't want to get two PhDs, okay? Um, and uh, you, you know, if your goal is to make money, then probably you, you, you want to go to uh, Wall Street as early as possible. Uh, 
So you uh, and 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 you really want to learn uh, on the job. You know, uh, nowadays I think with uh, a lot of online tools, Wikipedia, etc., uh, you uh, you can learn a lot uh, uh, on the job. And now, in terms of the means, uh, you want to learn and build a unique set of tools. Uh, so in our case, uh, we, we, we think we have a secret weapon. And that is, we are very good in setting up these uh, in vitro or cell alchemical assays to address uh, important bio, uh, biological problems. And then we are also very uh, good at doing this protein purification. These are all uh, techniques that I learned from my PhD mentor, Dr. Cecil Picard. And these are sort of, you know, nowadays it can be considered old fashioned technology, but they are very, very powerful. And we have been using these over and over again to make uh, new discoveries. And, and you want to be able to step on the giants shoulder. Uh, it's, it's very important to have a very good mentor. Uh, so mentorship is very important. And here, you know, I just want to give you some examples. And I think one famous example is uh, uh, Maria Curie, uh, the, the chemist uh, who won two Nobel Prizes, uh, one in physics and one in chemistry. Her husband also won a, a Nobel Prize in physics. Her daughter won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Her daughter-in-law won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And, and her, uh, uh, another daughter-in-law uh, won a Nobel Prize in peace. So in this family, they have you know, basically like six Nobel Prizes. And so that, uh, uh, that I think the inference, I, I believe mentorship uh, is very important. And another uh, good example is uh, from Dr. Corey. So Dr. Corey uh, and his wife, Gertie Corey, uh, they were professors at uh, Wash U in St. Louis. And they, uh, they won a Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, for uh, research in uh, metabolism. But they also train uh, many outstanding biochemists. And many of these, several of these biochemists, they have gone on and won the Nobel Prizes themselves. And I counted eight uh, Nobel laureates who were trained directly or indirectly by uh, Dr. Corey. So I think that's quite remarkable. Uh, it, I think this illustrates that mentorship is very important. I think another uh, uh, good example is provided here. And, and here, uh, I, I know more about this because Dr. Joe Goldstein and Dr. Michael Brown uh, uh, are uh, two Nobel laureates at UT Southwestern. They uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1985 for the uh, discovery of, uh, of a, a, a receptor that is very important. Uh, it's called LDL receptor. It's very important in cholesterol metabolism. And Dr. Uh, Goldstein uh, was trained by Dr. Marshall Nirenberg, who won the Nobel Prize for cracking the genetic code. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown, uh, was trained by Dr. Earl Stammen, also at NIH. And Dr. Earl Stammen uh, was, a, was a brilliant biochemist who, uh, who uh, although he didn't win a Nobel Prize, he got uh, the uh, National Medal of Science, uh, which was a very high honor. And Dr. Joe Goldstein and Dr. Michael Brown, they have a joint lab. They have trained many brilliant scientists. And and, and that includes Dr. Tom Sudov, who won the Nobel Prize um, 
a few years ago. And Dr. Helen Hobbs, who uh, won the Breakthrough Prize. So I, th I think this really illustrates how important to, uh, to have a good mentor. Okay, so uh, in summary, this is what I think, uh, that uh, a, few, a few things that, it, uh, that one uh, needs in order to succeed. Uh, you, need, you, you need to aim high. Uh, you need to ask an important question, want to solve an important problem, and you want to reward yourself by having a uh, real, realistic goal or milestone. Uh, you want to have a strong will to succeed, uh, to be determined to succeed. Uh, uh, perseverance is very important and hard work uh, can also be very important. But, but you want to enjoy the process, you don't want to burn yourself out early. <clears throat> uh, you want to take the direct, most direct route, uh, time is precious. Uh, and you want to try to develop a unique skill sets. Uh, and you want to have very good mentors. And uh, getting good education is also very important. Uh, Dr. Chen, uh, yeah, yeah. just wanted to keep an eye on the time here so we have enough time for questions. All right. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think it's very, I think it is, I'm getting to the last point. Huh? Sure, go ahead. What is success? Okay, I think uh, it's hard to define success because uh, it's all relative. And, uh, you know, if you think that I am uh, successful because I, you know, make some discoveries uh, and won a few prizes, uh, I can say that, you know, my accomplishment is really uh, trivial when it compares to, to uh, to this discovery, and that's published in this very short paper, it's a nature paper, it was a, a page and a half. Uh, and that was the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA um, by Dr. Jim Watson and Dr. Francis Crick. And at the end of this paper, they pointed out that it has not escaped our notice that the specific parent we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanisms for the genetic material. So the, the structure of the DNA double helix is huge. I think it's the, probably the mo most important discovery in the past century. And um, that basically explains the, the secret of life. And it, it basically it, um, allows the uh, the uh, entire biomedic, bio, biotech and biopharmaceutical uh, industry to develop. And, um, and that leads to uh, many, many drugs that have now been effective in curing um, uh, many human diseases. So I think this is enormous. Okay, so now if you don't discover uh, this DNA double helix, you know, is this are you a failure? And absolutely not. Because I think in the end, what is success? In, in my mind, I think uh, if you're healthy and if you're happy, then you are a success. And I think that's most important. And then on top of that, if you're healthy and if you're happy, and if you enjoy doing science, then I think it would be wonderful to make a few uh, uh, scientific discoveries. So that's, uh, that's the, my presentation, and these are the people in my lab who um, uh, uh, contributed uh, enormously to the discovery of CGAS and CGAN, and in particular, uh, 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 Dr. Josh Sun, uh, the brilliant biochemist in my lab, and uh, Josh Yi Wu, uh, who was a graduate student in my lab, and um, they discovered CGAS and CGAM. And we uh, have many collaborators at UT Southwestern and elsewhere uh, who uh, help us in uh, uh, making a, 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 a series of scientific discoveries, and we are very fortunate to have this uh, 
funding agencies that support our work. And then finally, I want to thank the uh, uh, Foundation for the NIH uh, and for uh, sponsoring uh, this talk. Thank you very much. I will now take. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, we have a few questions from students who uh, submitted them prior to the talk through our RSVPs. So I'm gonna go ahead and read you a couple of them. Eleanor from the United Kingdom asked, outside of the lab, what do you do for fun? How do you manage to balance your time effectively to include other things that you enjoy? Well, uh, yeah, so there's an interesting question. Um, well, first of all, I join my work uh, so much that I do spend most of my time uh, uh, in the lab. You know, I enjoy talking to students and postdocs in my lab, uh, and, I, and I think it's really a lot of fun. Uh, and then outside uh, my lab, uh, one thing that I do, which is also related to work, is that I travel uh, to give talks, uh, go to scientific conferences, and, and then uh, because of this, uh, I have uh, sort of travel all over the world. And, uh, and if I go to a, a fun place, an interesting place that I have not been to, then I, you know, I will uh, you know, take some time off and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and see the place. Uh, and I enjoy spending time uh, with my family, uh, uh, especially when my daughters were growing up. Uh, and, um, and, you know, so, so, so that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's why I do. I have some other uh, hobbies as well. Um, and uh, so, so I, I do try to, to, to keep a good uh, balance between work and, um, in other activities, uh, but I I spend most of my time uh, doing things that are related to to my research because I actually enjoy it. Wonderful. Um, we have a, another question from Anna in Romania. She asks, "What is a book or a resource, related or not related to biochemistry, that has inspired you throughout your education?" A book. Uh, well, so I, uh, well, when I, when I was in China, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned that I, uh, uh, I got interested in biochemistry from uh, listening to, 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 the, uh, to the lectures by uh, Professor Zhang. And, and then since then, I have uh, read some uh, textbooks in biochemistry. Um, and uh, the uh, in in it's not a particular book that uh, that uh, plays a most uh, important role. I think I read quite a few uh, book uh, books related to biochemistry. And you know sometimes although the title of the book is not biochemistry, um, but but biochemistry is become uh, is a very important component of the book. For example, this book called the Gene. Uh, that was written by Ben Lewin, uh, uh, you know, covers a molecular biology as, a, as well as a biochemistry. And I think that was a very good book that I read. Great. Um, and I, I have one more question uh, from Hargan in Canada. He asks, do you feel that exponential technologies such as artificial intelligence or nanotechnology will heavily influence biochemistry in the next five to 10 years? If so, how and what are some applications that you see? Oh, absolutely. So I think uh, both uh, the, uh, AI and nanotechnologies, they are very important now in, uh, now, now in research, but also in drug discovery. So for example, uh, for AI, I think it's going to uh, revolutionize the drug discovery process. For example, uh, you know, now we, you know, we have the, the atomic structures of many proteins and, and some of these proteins can be very good drug target. And if you want to, you know, develop a drug that target this protein, so for, for example, C-gas, you know, 
the traditional way of doing that is that you will screen uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of or, or even millions of a small molecule library and then you come up with a so-called a, 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 a lead molecule and then you put in you know uh, many medicinal chemists try to optimize the molecule and it's a lot of trial and error it's not very efficient but i think that uh, ai with computer uh, uh, modeling and calculation will uh, tremendously uh, facilitate this process uh, wouldn't it be terrific they say in 10 years you can just look at the structure of a protein target and then you can design a small molecule that fit into a pocket in the protein and that molecule then becomes a billion dollar drug. I, I think that's tremendous. And similarly, nanotechnology will have a very huge impact in drug delivery. So for example, this molecule that I talked about, CGAM, is a very potent uh, stimulator, uh, stimulus of, uh, of the immune system. But trying to deliver this specifically to tumor cells is a challenge, uh, and nanotechnology can really help. Wonderful. Um, we have a question from Angela. She would like to know about your failures and how you have learned from them. Well, uh, failure, failure is very common in research. Uh, and we, you know, we have a lot of failures, uh, especially if you want to solve an uh, important problem. You know, I, I think that uh, we will have a lot more failures than success. I think what the important thing is that, that you know, when experiments don't work, you don't look at this as a failure. I think you, you actually, you use the data, you analyze the data and, and try to learn something from that and, and then uh, to improve upon that and design the next experiment. And, it, you know, that hopefully it works. So as long as you design your experiment carefully with proper controls, as long as you can determine, interpret the data, then you should, you should actually, uh, you know, sort of look at each data, including, you know, data that don't, uh, that doesn't, uh, uh, that, that is not as you expected. You have to look at this data uh, as, as information. Uh, very useful information. And sometimes a failure, you know, when you get some results that are not expected, you know, that, that can be considered a failure, you, you can actually um, look at them as opportunities because some of these failures, um, the experiments that don't work as expected, can tell you something new. It can actually take you into a new direction. So, you know, uh, sometimes you will have certain uh, deputy and discovery and, and, and you know, many of those come from these uh, experiments that are called failure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, all right, we have one more question. Um, this is from Nishka. She asks, a lot of people suffer from autoimmune diseases around the world. How, does, how do solutions such as this discovery reach the neediest? Uh, uh, so, sorry again. I, I sure. Uh, she asks, a lot of people suffer from autoimmune diseases around the world. Yeah. How do solutions such as this reach the neediest? Oh, it reaches the neediest. Okay. Well, I think that um, first of all, we need to develop a drug uh, that is effective and safe in treating the particular autoimmune disease. I think that's, that's, you know, that's most important. And, and then uh, once we develop the drug, then we want to make it available to as many patients as possible, including uh, those patients who cannot afford it. And that requires a lot of uh, uh, efforts from, um, you know, from uh, different uh, parts of the society, the government, uh, the uh, philanthropy, the companies, uh, uh, many organizations to, to make sure that 
these drugs can, uh, can be used by uh, as many patients as possible. Wonderful. I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, I want to say a, a huge thank you to you, Dr. Chen, for presenting to our students, and thank you to everyone who attended live. Um, we will be posting the recording of this talk and also sending out a post-talk survey for everyone who participated to sort of give us a bit of feedback. Um, and so, Dr. Chen, if, if that's it, we want to say a huge thank you to you and to the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.